Long time no see. Now, when I originally wrote that opening line, I meant it as a joke because many of us have spent the last 10 days continually attending services. Between Erev and morning services, High Holy Days and Shabbat, we have gotten to engage with one another a lot. But then I was reminded that long time no see is not a joke at all because this is the very first sermon that I will deliver from this bima where I can actually see <laughs> members of this amazing congregation. You all look great, by the way. I will admit, it is a challenge to deliver a Devar Torah the day after Yom Kippur. You have already heard so much wisdom shared from this bima. You have also reflected for days on the lives that you lead, on the people and causes you care about. And you are probably ready to move on from the seriousness of the Day of Atonement. But the Torah portion this week is Ha'azinu, a poem delivered by Moses to the people of Israel just before he dies. Not exactly the transition out of solemnity that we would hope for. Ha'azinu is hard to read, not only because Moses is coming to the end of his life, but because in it, he is quite harsh and accusatory. He chastises the Israelites for forsaking God in the wilderness, and he worries that they will make the same mistakes when they cross into the promised land. He details the many punishments that God will rain down upon the people due to their behavior. He talks of betrayal and wrath and retribution. There seems to be a lot of anger in this moment, but I want to suggest that there is something else going on here, that Moses' guiding emotion is actually fear. Remarking on the relationship of the Israelites to God, Moses says, Tzur yeladcha tashi, vatishkach el mecholecha. You neglected the rock that begot you, forgot the God who brought you forth. If it is possible for the people to forget the Almighty, how much more of a threat is this for our leader who is a mere mortal? Moses is afraid that the people will not remember his life and the lessons he imparted. Read in this way, we come to understand Ha'azinu as an ethical will. Ethical wills, or tzavaot, have a rich history in the Jewish tradition. Before Moses, our forefather Jacob issued blessings, curses, and burial instructions from his deathbed. This practice was taken up by Talmudic rabbis, medieval community leaders, and a pre-modern Yiddish mother. And it doesn't end there. Our adult engagement team held a workshop last spring in which some folks from our very own community had the chance to learn about and draft ethical wills. Those who write ethical wills tend to do three things. They review their personal history, acknowledge their mortality, and articulate messages for generations to come. In this way, they grapple with the past, present, and future. What if we did the same thing tonight? The first part of this assignment, reviewing the past, would be relatively easy because we just spent the last 10 days doing exactly that. In 5781, we experienced multiple waves of COVID, a vaccine rollout, political polarization, extreme weather events, and so much more. On a personal level, some of us endured the lows of isolation, loss, unemployment, illness, and burnout. Others enjoyed the highs of quality time with loved ones, introspection, births and marriages, and new learning. Most of us experienced some combination of these things. The second part of our task, assessing the present, gets a little trickier. 
We had hoped that we would be in the promised land by now, in a place that felt safe and free from worry, but that is not the case. We are still living in the wilderness. But, just like Moses, we can articulate life lessons while standing in this uncertain space. Now, it wouldn't be fair of me to assign the task of creating an ethical will if I were not ready to do the work myself. But I want to acknowledge that it's pretty chutzpahdik to try and copy Moses in proclaiming my life lessons to the congregation. After all, he was an unparalleled leader speaking at the end of his 120 years of life. I, on the other hand, am partway through my rabbinic training. We say you earn one letter of the word rabbi for every year of rabbinical school. Having finished three years, I am an R.A.B., whereas he was Moshe Rabbeinu, the greatest rabbi our people have ever known. But that being said, this is something I have given some thought to because the pandemic created many opportunities for personal reflection. And I know I'm not the only one who has taken a step back to assess her life. We have been reading articles for months about people leaving their jobs, switching industries, and reevaluating goals because they had crystallizing moments in this past year. In truth, our tradition invites us to do this sort of evaluation every year during the High Holy Days, but it feels different and deeper this time around. Given all that, here are some life lessons I have learned from living through this challenging time, this winding wilderness. Number one, it is important to enjoy your own company. I used to think I was an extrovert. After all, according to the Myers-Briggs test, I am an ENTJ. The E stands for extrovert. But after spending months living solo with very restricted social interactions, I grew to appreciate time alone. I like the way I process the world. I like getting lost in my imagination when reading a book. I like taking walks on my own in the park. And it's important to like spending time with yourself because, as they say, wherever you go, there you are. Two. When it comes to relationships, quality matters so much more than quantity. When lockdown began, I reached out to everyone in my contacts just to keep from feeling bored or disconnected. But by last September, I had pruned down the list of people I kept in contact with dramatically. I think I'm not alone in this experience. When we are trudging through something so hard, our energy flags, and we need to tap into those relationships that sustain us with people who lift our spirits, who let us show up exactly as we are, who love us no matter what. Those are quality relationships. Three, self-care is not about bubble baths, it's about boundaries. There is a version of self-care that's marketable scented candles and face masks and manicures. But true self-care is about identifying what drains us and limiting the time and energy we spend engaging with those things. Setting boundaries can be incredibly challenging, especially when it means changing existing habits or patterns. But it is how I both revive and value myself. And finally, number four, this life we have is a gift, and it is precious beyond measure. I have this community to thank for this lesson. In Mishkan services, many of you jumped at the chance to share when I asked for examples of daily miracles, talking about new grandchildren, a call with a friend, a blossoming flower, or the beauty of a sunrise. Others opened up in private correspondences about your search for meaning, for learning, for growth. And others shared in the Facebook chat about sickness and recovery, loss and love. 
What a blessing to be part of a community that can hold all of that. These are just some of the lessons I've learned, and I hope you all will share your own insights from this time in the wilderness. We are fortunate to be leading, uh, learning and teaching from an even better position than our great leader Moses found himself in. He delivered Ha'azinu, his ethical will speech, right before ascending Har Nevo, where he would pass on. You and I have the opportunity to stick around after we articulate these lessons. We get more time to help them take root, not only among the next generation, but also within ourselves. And we can enjoy the fruits of our labor as we focus on living a life that embodies the lessons and values we care about most. We can make it out of this wilderness and into the promised land. And in 5782, we can lead lives guided by our hard-won wisdom, lives certainly worth remembering. <laughs>